What is good, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us once again on an episode of the Coffee Roaster Warm-Up Sessions. Sheesh, we missed last week because, well, mm. sometimes you just have to prioritize some things <laughs> like running a business mm. and uh, all kinds of other activities that we had to get done um, to keep the train moving. But uh, yeah, it feels like it's been forever, but we're happy to be back. Missed only one weekend, so uh, hopefully y'all can forgive us, but we're back with some batch brew. This time I have some some Topo Chico with me. Um, it's my choice of uh, mineral water or carbonated water. What's mineral water? <laughs> I have no idea. I was like, I does that mean other water doesn't have any minerals in it? <laughs> it does Why is it mineral water carbonated? It's huh. a good point. Is it all water mineral water? What's a mineral? I, mean, I feel so what, stupid, what defines <laughs> folks. Drop it in the comments or something. Yeah. Teach me what the what? Why the? Why, why does all? I feel like all the carbonated water says mineral water. Am I wrong? No, I don't think you're wrong. I just don't know why. Hold on. What is mineral? I'm, per- I'm perplexed. Hey Siri, what is mineral water? Mineral water is water from a mineral spring that contains mm. various minerals, such as salts <laughs> and sulfur compounds. <laughs> Do you want me to keep reading? No, we're on a podcast. Not a good time. <laughs> You're done, Siri. Yeah. It's like mineral water. Mineral water yeah. is water that contains minerals coming out of a mineral it's spring. spring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. I mean, but I Where else say, does water come from other than a spring? Glacier? I don't know. Melted? I don't know. A river? Uh, that, is that a spring? I don't know. Look, dude. Isn't water a out well? of a well an yeah. under, underground spring or stream? Maybe. Uh, dude. Strange. Oh man. Powerful or what? Dude, tell them the story. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know no, why we are... decided. I don't know why we decided to stick with the brew. We should have just rebrewed. Honestly, right, it's the best brew I've had of this coffee. <laughs> really? I have never had this coffee, so I don't know what's good. I don't. I don't think I've had it better. <laughs> This is powerful, <laughs> folks. Uh, no. Mm. This is great. No, it's not great. It's great. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe it's the mental bias of watching what happened. Friends, All right, so basically. <laughs> listen. So, for those of you on the video watching on YouTube, uh, this will help you this help you uh visualize this. So, there's this so there's this lid to the batch mm. brewer. This lid goes on the carafe, and then the carafe slides into its like socket yeah. or into its place. I mean, it, it's a smart which, lid because it's a smart brewer, right? Right. I guess so. And when it goes in there, the lid pushes the spring mm-hmm. down that unlatches the the top part of the carafe. What is that called? The, uh, the the brew basket. The brew basket, and then the water drips through. That's how pretty much all the, all batch brewers work. I think no. so. No. No, the but, ratio doesn't work that way. Oh, interesting. Well, anyways, so the the lid on the carafe is what pu- pushes it, like the spring down mm-hmm. that allows the water to come through drain. to drain. So I just put the carafe in there without the lid. And I was like, I looked at the lid and my thoughts were strange. I think that's supposed to go somewhere. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, all right. Okay, sure. Happens. We'll see what happens. It's brewing. Like, it's like all the water is gone. It's like, and I'm like, why is there no coffee in the carafe? Like, there's <laughs> nothing in there. Like, the water's the water in the reservoir is gone, but it's not in the, the carafe. timer started already. <laughs> on the thing, it says your brew was brewed. To <laughs> keep warm. I'm like, watch. huh, yeah. what's it, what is it keeping warm? And I'm like, wait, this is weird. This is some kind of problem. <laughs> Anyways, I look over and I realize that the thing is, the lid is out, not there. So the water is just hanging out in the brew basket. Mm. Just a nice little cr- clever dripper. Like, <laughs> this is like a, <laughs> like the trickle it on the massive scale. You guys, oh, this man. was powerful. And so literally it's just steeping, steeping, full immersion. Excellent. Put the lid back in, slide it in. The water just drains right through. Delicious. The bed was perfectly clean, like something you'd want to sleep on. Yeah. It was powerful. Like, yeah. you guys, I'm all for this brew. Um, it's tasty. No, it's not. No. 
This may be the worst brew of the episode. Uh, <laughs> uh, not the, the episode podcast? of the podcast. No, no, dude. Oh, I can't believe this is how this this came down. This happened. <laughs> it's bad. But, you know, I'll tell you, it tastes kind of fruity. I mean, coffee is a fruit, so no matter what, coffee tastes fruity. No, there's still a fermentation to it. Mm. You can taste the fermentation. You can. It's Folks, it's a natural coffee from Proud Mary. Yeah, yeah. From their Finca Hartman mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. farm. Uh, it's uh, Panama. Yeah. Panama coffee. Margot Gipe Margo varietal, Gipe. which is kind of a mm. fun little treat. Natural process. It's their what, wild. Not their deluxe, but their wild mm. coffee. Um, apparently, it's supposed to be good. But this me this brew method somehow is not, <laughs> it's not working. Definitely not a clever coffee. The recipe coffee. needs to be yeah. changed. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. you know the I like I like Proud Mary. Proud Mary like I think serves some really bonkers coffees. Probably some mm. of the home to some of my favorite coffee cafe experiences mm. and coffee experiences. But I'm gonna say this on the podcast and no bad feelings to to Proud Mary. I love them, but it's so hard to brew their coffee for me. Oh yeah. I just always have like a really like subpar experience. But when you go to their cafe, their coffees are so good. Mm -hmm. It's literally like you like you're trying coffee on a different planet. It's probably water. We always talk about that. It's probably I, water. Probably. Yeah. I I honestly would not be surprised. Mm. For real. Which makes me wonder like I wonder if they're if they're tasting if they're cupping coffees with their water and adjusting their roast profile with their water yeah and I therefore mean, I, therefore yeah. when it gets makes sense when it gets to for example like bellingham i'm brewing with my funky water that their roast profiles don't taste as good or mm -hmm. not that, it's not that they don't taste as good it's just that i always struggle to find the sweet spot yeah um and it's not that they're bad coffees or bad roast once again it's just I struggle finding that sweet spot with their yeah. coffees, and I wonder if that's why it's because they're 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 doing their QC to a certain kind of water content. We're doing our QC yeah. to a certain kind of water content, and I mean that's a we've always said this, and I'll, I'll repeat it again. That's one of the most underestimated variables in coffee preparation. So underestimated. So underestimated. And there's really no easy solution to it either, mm -hmm. as of now. Well, until uh, Lance comes up with a Mr. better Hendrick, idea. Mr. Hendrick, dude. Mr. Hendrick, come on the podcast. Come talk about your Lotus water. Lo is that what it is? Lotus? I think it's called Lotus. Flying Lotus. That's a band. Dude, Lotus like the sports car. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Little yeah. two-seater. Two-seater yeah. zipper -roo. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, speaking of that. Proud Mary is probably one of my favorite coffee roasters in of all time. Hmm. Hmm. Um, it's a hot take. It's a hot take. I also hate that they mostly do like naturals and anaerobics. Mm -hmm. All of you on the podcast know I'm not a fan. But something about their coffees. Dude, I had a geisha last time I was there that just like blew my socks off. Mm. It was a washed geisha. Dude, so tasty. And... um. You know, there's something about appreciating like a good cup of coffee and being like, oh yeah, they're good roasters. Mm -hmm. And then when you start roasting coffee yourself, you're like, oh no, they're freaking good at what they do. Exactly. No, no, no. They're legendary. Yeah. Because yeah. the game's the game's not really as easy as, and the interesting thing is like a lot of people who are like, man, I, I want to start my coffee roasting company. And we always have like people mm -hmm. reach out, talk about, ask us. Uh, once again, I'd say like, go first off go learn somewhere else other than on your own beans but yeah at the end of the day i'm like don't do this. just don't it's <laughs> not it's not as it's not as as flying yeah. rainbows and butterflies yeah. as as you may think you know it's yeah. actually like a craft yeah and the craft also doesn't have very many rules to it yeah which means it's kind of like getting tossed in the deep end of the pool hopefully yeah. you learn how to swim if not well sucks yeah. dude i mean it's the classic like uh scott says you have to roast like a thousand batches before you actually f understand roasting or something like that and don't even, take those even words that, lightly it's probably yeah. true yeah and even that itself is like what does that mean like when you understand 
how roasting works, does that automatically mean that you roast great coffee? Uh, debatable, right? Um, Speaking of which, we're approaching 1,000 roasts. We are. Are we? Really? Oh, yeah. Where are we at? Do you know? I don't know, but it's pretty close to 1,000. Dude, we should be pros. Dude, it's, I, once, gonna go once you hit 1,000, you're like, yeah. dude, you're ready to compete. <laughs> exactly. Like <laughs> Roasters Guild. Like, I have the <laughs> Roasters Guild literally sweater on. Yeah. Like, like uh, you're next level, dude. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But yeah, I don't, yeah. I think there's so much, uh, hidden knowledge is not the right term, but like hidden information or there's a lot of information that people protect and like hide and uh, gatekeep. And honestly, the reason that happens, I think well, like, we don't we don't know, but the speculation, yeah, speculations. Yeah. Like, well, even even uh, beforehand, like before we owned Mir, we would ask people information about roasting, and no one really has many clear answers. Yeah, because there's a lot of speculative information, like oh, maybe this, maybe that. Like, I've had other roasters tell me, like, oh man, you're probably uh, uh, you have a unequal distribution of heat. And it was very, very like what's these, that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that look like? Um, why? Like, there's not a lot. There's these big statements that sound very smart, um, but they don't really uh, mean much. And I think that also has to do with because there's just a lack of like ob- objective information. Like, no one really knows mm-hmm. exactly how uh, roasting works. Um, we, we're all like, I, th- I guess, grasping at the idea of roasting. Yeah. Um, but but, it's progressing quite a bit. Yes. And I think that it's not that nobody knows anything. I think though that like after Mm -hmm. you've learned and experimented and worked around, you start to pick up on some cues. And of course, at the end of the day, your palate is guiding you. Your palate is the lantern, you know, through the Mm -hmm. forest. Your palate is the compass that you're literally venturing into uh, no man's land. You know, like your palate is the the vehicle that that takes you there it's yeah everything yeah and which is underrated also is like something i will i'm gonna i should start telling you guys who are like what should i do you know with coffee roast i'm like go train your palate you know oh yeah and so um that being said, that being said like there's a lot that we could say on this and we've already said a lot on the yeah. podcast before in previous episodes so We've been dropping a lot of coffees recently. At least it feels like this. Mm-hmm. We have some more coffees on the way coming up, which means we're getting fresh coffees that we've never roasted before, and we're mm-hmm. tossing it into the roaster. And I just want to break down well, what's the what's the, our process like with taking dump like diving into a new coffee that we don't know how it's gonna roast. Is it gonna crash after a first crack? Is it gonna yeah. flick there? Does it take on heat? All this stuff. Yeah. What's the first thing that you consider when thinking when you know you're about to drop in that first batch? What do you what's going through your mind? Oh, lots of things. And uh, what can be helpful also for yeah. the people more specifically cuz we want this podcast to be helpful yeah. and share information. So. I would say the approach that that we take when we roast coffee would um be the classic declining ROR approach. Mm -hmm. And I know that can ruffle feathers. I get it. I understand like people are going to start taking flight um, after this. But at the end of the day, what it allows me to do is to a degree it rationalizes um, uh, and helps me understand how to take and how to basically drive the roast through. Um, One, because the ROR is simply like the accelerator is how fast um wait i always mix that up yeah it's how fast the rate how fast you're moving through the roast so when you have a declining ror it allows you to basically take a roast to the end goal at a in a proper way so if for example if a coffee crashes or the ror goes down too quick um you're not going to get to the desired end temp um, if the ROR spikes, you're going to have one, not only defective flavors in your cup, but you're also going to probably get to your time quicker. 
Um, so there's different elements of that. The ROR, like having a nice declining ROR helps you control the roast. That's how I'm, I process that information, which could be the same concept could be also a different perspective on how you process what the ROR means to you in a sense of how important or lack of importance it has. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think one of the things that, you know, a steady declining RR will help you um, direct your roast into the direction that you want it to go. Yeah. Um, and it's more information as to what you need to do with the gas settings yeah. to get to your, you know, to your destination, which is a roasted coffee yeah. that you enjoy, you know? Yeah. Um, and although this can be controversial, um, so be it. But I actually think you can taste that. Yeah. Like... I, you know what say say what you want you know flail your arms if you know if you know more please enlighten me yeah. <laughs> but as of right now and what i've tasted what i've been able to pick up on things um with my palate once again mm -hmm. being the driving factor um which is still growing as well uh but that having a steady declining ror all the way through your roast mm -hmm. actually gets reflected in the cup yeah and it may not be like a night and day, like, well, if you don't have a perfectly declining ROR, mm -hmm. your your coffee sucks. Well, yeah, probably not. However, it's the declining ROR that I think, in my opinion, takes your coffee to the next level. That yeah. adds the, you know, just that really pleasant experience that's just like, okay, this there's something really, really great about this roast or this roaster or yeah. whatever it is, whatever they're doing with the coffee, they're doing it really well. Like it's just that like little hunch that I think really sets you apart in, in yeah. my opinion. And I could be, I could be wrong, but that's what I've been able to test well, taste. Yeah. Um, and I think it's some things that we've been able to test as well through our roast process. Yeah. Um, something that we've noticed just cupping a lot of coffees and, Tasting Scott Rayo's roast defect kit oh, yeah. has been a great a learning experience. Yeah. Um, so all those things, I think, has led us to believe that it's both helpful in how you're directing the roast, but also I think there are some beneficial um, yeah. results in the cup that actually make the coffee taste better. Yeah. Um, but I, I think yeah. because the ROR is such a big deal, at least for us and for many roasters, it also holds on to a lot of other information like mm -hmm. it will affect your roast time, right? Yeah. Um, it will affect if you're looking for elements such as, you know, yellowing, drying, all of those elements that um, are still present in the roast. Your coffee changes, your coffee goes through phases. Mm -hmm. But ROR kind of, maybe this is not the right term, but kind of simplifies all of those elements and puts it in a form or a graph mm -hmm. and allows you to see those elements happening because how hard and how fast your coffee is um, progressing is gonna affect all the other things like, oh, your coffee dried, your coffee went into yellowing, your coffee was roasted in eight minutes or uh, 14 minutes, your ROR is gonna affect all of those. So when you focus on one thing, it allows you to have more control over the roast, at least for me. So I think that would be the main thing. And then the next thing, um, definitely color, you know, that's, for most folks, uh, everyone understands that element is like, hey, color is going to um, be a defining factor to what your cup tastes like. If, even if you don't roast, you're going into a grocery store and you're going to look at dark roast, light roast, medium roast. Um, so same thing, that would be a major part of the roasting process is how light or dark do you want to take your coffee? And when you have that declining ROR and you kind of figured out how the coffee is going, then you know when to stop roasting or when to continue roasting. Um, and that affects flavor. I think both you and I have seen, I mean, even with the facsimile cuppings that we pull out a coffee and brew it and then measure it on our meter that measures color. And we're blown away how difference, how much difference we can taste in different colors of the same coffee. Yeah. I think what we talked about, like just right now with ROR where the ROR is leading towards some kind of destination that you're trying mm -hmm. to hit. That destination is ultimately color. Mm -hmm. That destination is how dark or how light you want your bean to be, which is a great indicator to when you should be dropping your coffee. Um, 
for that reason is that color is such a big indicator of flavor mm -hmm. and if you're going for you know something dark and something a little bit more roasty you're going to you can't get that flavor profile of dark and roasty without going dark yeah and you can't get you know all the flavor nuances of a light roast yeah by going dark yeah. you know like i that sounds very uh, obvious and it seems like well yeah that's common sense but if you take that kind of that concept and if you now break it up and go super narrow on it for example like the span of a light roast mm -hmm. then things get a little bit more interesting and complicated because then you're thinking well you know you have like a three four five degree difference in terms of what's considered a light roast mm -hmm. like that light roast range well you can't get the same flavors at you know at the beginning of the range as you would at the end of the range, right, yeah. like and then that sends you into like a lot of um, a lot of n just nuance and exploring mm -hmm. within that range. Um, and one way that we've been able to do that, especially when we're just dialing in a batch, a coffee that we've never roasted before, um, even though experience experience roasting other coffees from similar origins. Um, of similar processing methods, it gives you a lot of data to work with. Right. Like yeah. it's so much easier dialing coffees now after we've been roasting for the last two years on that machine in that environment. Yeah. It's so much easier now because we have two years worth of data yeah. where we can say, oh, okay, remember when we roasted this Guji or that mm -hmm. Silhouette or that, you know, Colombian that we can compare and kind of yeah. use that as kind of a direct direction but what's been helping a lot also is taking our ikawa sample roaster and sample roasting three four different roasts of varying temperatures and cupping them all side by side blindly and then choosing which one tastes the best and then that's a it's not a for sure this is what we need it's more like it's this is a great yeah. ballpark that we can play mm -hmm. with in you know yeah i mean you said a lot there because not only are returning coffees easier to roast the second time around, um, they're also like those processes. Like if you take, if we had an Ethiopian that was washed and then we got a Ethiopian that was natural, uh, even the processing method within the region mm -hmm. will kind of define on how we approach that yeah. roast. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, from everything, you know what I mean? Yeah. From how we start the roast to how we end the roast when it comes to color. But even the whole process, because making gas changes on a wash coffee completely different than making a controlling gas mm -hmm. on a natural coffee. Yeah. So there's those elements. But the more you do certain, even certain processing methods, whether it's a natural Colombian versus a natural Ethiopian, you start noticing what uh, the processing method does to your roast process. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to gauge that way. Um, I think the challenging thing is like, let's say like you and I just picked up a coffee, uh, from Bolivia mm -hmm. and it was, I mean, this is completely made up. So hypothetically a Bolivian coffee that was wet hulled, something we've never, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, Bolivia probably doesn't do wet hulled or let's not, even throw We would not buy yeah. a Bolivian <laughs> wet hulled coffee. Sumatran coffee but wet we'll hulled. Take, we'll that take, seems we'll more reasonable. Geisha. How about yeah. that? Let's get, but, let's get, yeah. That's even varietal. That's a whole yeah. different, um, you know. A washed geisha. There. Yeah. Um, but yeah. like elements like that, like, well, how how would you, again, like how would you approach roasting a coffee completely brand new on the scale like that? Yeah, I think, well, I think once again, kind of what we talked about within the scope of, I mean, we're talking about color here for this second point that we think mm -hmm. are, is important. Well, looking at taking the ikawa example like finding something so you don't have to dump 10 yeah. pounds of coffee or 20 pounds of coffee why not just sample roast on a small little 50 gram and just experiment with different roast profiles at different color um, but i think also taking in information like not just processing but your your water content is going to be a big deal um, and that's something that comes with having a lot of data of past mm -hmm. experience, right. um, water content, your water activity, your bean size is going to yeah. matter. Is it, you know, a uh, pac Pacamaro or Margagipe, which are huge, these beans, or is it a pea berry? Mm -hmm. Those things are going to respond significantly different. And, um, 
And especially when you're going in with like an origin that you've never roasted before, all you can do really is just just send it. Right. <laughs> send yeah. it, get your best, most calculated, educated guess, and at some point just hope for the best. And then that first batch will give you a lot of information because then you can mm-hmm. move wherever you want after that yeah. first batch because – well, th- yeah, there's a lot of data. Yeah. There. And there, with experience, there are certain uh, things that you start to realize in general. Um, mm-hmm. What happens during the roast is the fact like, you know, coffee takes on heat and then it starts giving off of heat, uh, mm-hmm. giving off heat. Um, coffees tend to crash post crack because they're basically sweating. So there's elements that you can kind of kind of predict maybe not completely defined Mm -hmm. so you know like oh just because this is a bolivian coffee you're not going to go into crack with like you know 80 percent gas like you know that's not going to happen no matter what so you Mm -hmm. still know that you need to bring it down but then i think within that is also like understanding some elements that happen like with like post crack so you're preparing for the stage of everybody talks about and blows probably out of proportion is DTR Mm -hmm. and the importance of what development time ratio, not just the time, but ratio through the rest of the rows does to the flavor. Does it enhance it? You know what I mean? Does, is there a certain number? Um, Those are things that I think for us has been like a challenging process of growth and understanding and cupping and blindly cupping again, Um, and then taking that information and saying like, okay, how much weight should we put on DTR? Is it more important than rose, uh, the rose color? Um, or is it equal to, or is it less than, you know what I mean? So I think that's a very big question that we think about when we're approaching Mm -hmm. roasting in general. So do you think we have a defined answer? For for the importance of DTR in general in the roast in comparison to, let's say, the other two things that we talked about is ROR, yeah. um, the rate of rise, or the color itself. I still think that I think DTR is important. Mm-hmm. Just like all, all your other pieces of information. Yeah. You can't just throw it out and assume that, oh, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, it definitely still matters, and I think it's it holds a lot of weight to it, mm-hmm. especially when you talk about it as – in terms of uh, a ratio, because yeah. ratios are ratios, exactly that. Ratios are giving you more information than just saying, oh, we spent one minute after mm-hmm. crack roasting the coffee. Well, ratio says, you know, you roasted one minute after crack, but the rest, everything before crack was nine minutes. Yeah. So it gives you a ratio for you to play with and uh, tinker with and um, when you can f- alter altering your DTR essentially you're altering the entire roast yes exactly. you know and yeah. so that's really helpful to know because um, it's also a very great indicator of uh, helps you do QC on your roast yeah because if your DTR is changing that means there's more than one thing that's changing yeah it's not like it's not like temperature well 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 you're just dropping a coffee at a higher temp, yeah. well, it's actually giving you a lot of information that you have to decode on a pretty big scale, yeah. actually. And I think that's one of the hardest things about roasting is understanding that everything is connected. Um, it's not like cut and dry, like all of a sudden, like if you have the right amount of development, your coffee is gonna obviously taste like this. Or if you have you know, the right, the right curve, your coffee's absolutely going to taste like this. Um, there's still like, I think one of the enlightening things for us has been the defect kit. Like, um, even the, like the, the good coffee, the good roast and the underdeveloped roast, they both, I believe, right. They both have a declining ROR, but they don't taste the same. Um, and that, so there's elements in a roast that are not, and I think majority of roasting, it's just not, 100% absolute. It's like, as soon as you nailed this, doesn't mean that your coffee is going to come out tasting like strawberries just because you hit, you know, 403 degrees or 402 degrees with um, one minute DTR. There's so many elements and they're all tied together. Yeah. I think if you're just roasting and you're trying to hit this exact temperature Mm -hmm. with this exact 
DTR with this exact roast time, with this exact, you know, turnaround point. That doesn't mean your coffee is going to taste like blueberries. Yeah. It just doesn't. Right. And so the hard part about, you know, meshing the last three things that we talked about is figuring out when one needs to move a certain direction, which is actually moving everything else yes. with it. Yeah. And finding balance. It's kind of like, um, what are those things called that kids sit on? It's like the teeter totter. The teeter totter. Yeah. Roasting is like the teeter totter, except it's not just two sides. Yeah. There's like five of them. And yeah. when one moves, all five of them go a different, different height, different mm -hmm. level. And you're supposed to figure out how each five of those, you know, teeter totters at what exact slant or height that they're sitting at mm -hmm. is going to result in the tastiest cup for that coffee yeah that's the bigger picture you know yeah. so um you know just because what even though to say on the flip side is that there are things that you can absolutely kind of know that probably won't taste good like yeah one percent of dtr i don't i i would no. not recommend yeah <laughs> dropping before crack i I don't know. I yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work. Yeah. Roasting and hoping that you have to have 25% of DTR for it yeah, to taste good. For sure. Probably not the yeah. case. Trying to roast dark roast to get a light roasted profile. Probably not yeah. the case. Having a 27 minute roast time. Probably not <laughs> yeah. okay for you. Yeah, totally. You know, like, and those are some things that you just kind of, I think, learn over time that help you narrow down where the teeter-totters are supposed to be yeah. in that ballpark. And then you turn some knobs yeah. to figure out what where that specific coffee needs to sit. Yeah, I think to sum all of these things up, I would say there's so many complex things happening in the roast, and the goal is to simplify them into elements that you can like manipulate and control. Mm -hmm. And then taste that and come up with a conclusion and what tastes best. And really, this podcast was also very difficult to process and to think yeah. through before recording for that reason. Yeah. Is that there's so much nuance and variables and variations that it's it's really difficult to just say that this is 100% factual set in stone mm -hmm. and everybody needs to follow this. Like... Once again, we say this all the time on the podcast, not even the best, most talented consultants, roasters, authors about roasting, mm -hmm. roasters around the world, probably not 100% of them agree on everything. Yeah. Yeah, and for sure, man, that that's the hard part for me. Like the more we roast, the more we learn about it, the more I have to rethink different elements that I was like, con felt like convinced of or agreed with. Um, yeah, like going into this podcast again, the language even behind it is scary. It's like that's why I feel like half of the time, even right now while recording, I feel like I'm like slowly talking cause I'm trying to give myself enough time to come up with the right words because I know that certain words can be one trigger words, but also can mean completely different. I mean, we've experienced yes. that. What does, what does, uh, what you does... know, a overdeveloped coffee mean to <laughs> Every single coffee Dude, professional, I would say there's so many coffee professionals. When you couple different people, yeah. they're like, oh, yeah, that's baked. And I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? What's that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Or, <laughs> overdeveloped. Is that a lot of development time or just color? Like, uh, There's so many nuances, and it is challenging, but I think... It's I think that's one thing like we've been able to break it down to a few elements that we choose to focus on controlling to find that balance yeah. again yeah and for those learning honestly once again you can always feel free to reach out to us we'd be always willing to share uh, what we've been learning um, yeah. what we've learned over the last several years and um you know so it kind of feels like that you know that meme with spider-man and <laughs> the other guys who are they're holding guns at yeah. each other. <laughs> That's yeah. literally what roasting feels like sometimes. You're like <laughs> Yeah. More acidity, more sweetness, more body. Like <laughs> anyways. Oh. Just end off this podcast with some cheer because dude, Yeah. Mm. Why not? 
Anyways, folks, thank you so much for listening. We have some exciting things coming. If you've made it this far, you're you're incredible. Yeah. Listen, you're incredible. Um, but there's some really exciting things coming mm. in the near future. So stay tuned. And uh, folks, we'll see you guys in the next one. And remember, reflect what's good. So much complex at the end of this roast. Or, I mean, in this <laughs> podcast. <laughs>